Okay, good day, everyone. This is Joe Gallo from ASPE, and I'd like you to welcome you to another one of our uh, fabulous webinars. We have a, a, a very good program today, uh, which um, Mark and the crew will uh, bring, you know, alert you to momentarily. And so then I'd like to give you the, uh, the, the formal disclaimer, and that is uh, what you saw when you uh, logged in. Uh, the information and opinions expressed in this presentation, and that includes verbal as well as, as what is uh, presented in written form, are not intended as recommendations by ASPE or the representatives or members of this presentation. Uh, for any medical treatment uh, or any other procedures that you would pursue, we strongly suggest that what you do is follow that up with your medical team. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mark Lichty, who is the chairman of ASPE. Thank you, Joe. And I'd like to welcome each of you to this webinar. Uh, and I'd particularly like to th thank Howard Walensky, one of our founders, for connecting us with the speakers today. And I give Howard a lot of credit for helping our nation, the US, and you know the, the world, really, to move towards safer biopsies. I'm particularly excited about this program since I lived in Sweden many years ago uh, in another, that's another Scandinavian country, uh, obviously. And, um, and the fact that we're reaching out to Norway here, this is why we're called Active Surveillance Patients International. Part of what we're trying to do is to scan the world and find out what's happening out there on, in the globe uh, with regard to, to uh, active surveillance. And this particular program is going to be fascinating because it has to do with a daughter and her father's urologist who together after the loss of her father led the charge in Norway for safer biopsies. And it's a moving story of uh, patient empowerment and patients taking charge to transform a nation in the way they do biopsies. 50% 50, 50 of you in the next 10 years are gonna to choose to move beyond active surveillance. Some because your prostate cancer is advanced, another 25%, 20 to 25% just due to anxiety. And, and for those of you on what we call humorously anxious surveillance, we hope to help you find a portal where you're gonna be comfortable being on active surveillance and not just ship off, shift off of active surveillance due to anxiety. Active Surveillance Patients International was created by men who have been on and studied active surveillance. And we have no financial motives. We're driven by an intense desire to help you forge a path that makes it easier for you we know from our own experience of having journeyed through uh, the anxious months and years and found some peace that there is a path to peace in living with active surveillance. And our purpose is to help men navigate, navigate active surveillance, to educate men on the latest technologies and to learn from one another. I've learned in the past 16 years that I've been on active surveillance and much of my initial anxiety was wasted effort. I also learned that the PC world, the prostate cancer world is evolving quickly. And um, active surveillance is a dynamic field as well. We're hoping that by the end of this call today, you're gonna feel more comfortable than you did at the beginning. And we honestly believe that you can thrive on active surveillance, have an abundant quality of life, and find a peaceful vi vigilance uh, as we have. All, and all of the speakers today, uh, I wanna thank them. They're donating their time. Uh, they are here to advance the cause of safe biopsies. Why are they doing it? They do it because they care. They care about um, avoiding sepsis from biopsies and saving lives. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, 
I, I want you to feel too that this is your organization, that you can influence the, the organization. And, and we're always in need of volunteers. And if you had volunteered and we didn't respond or we missed your response, don't hesitate to reach out again. In fact, I, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat box too. So uh, you can uh, find me there if necessary. So with that, Again, I thank you. I want to introduce Jeff, who's going to uh, say a word about uh, funds and how we can keep presenting these webinars. And I also uh, want to introduce Paul Clausen. I just want to say a word about him. Paul Clausen, one of the beauties of this uh, journey that we're all on here is that you meet such wonderful people. And Paul, who I met you know, probably 10 or 11 years ago, has become a dear friend. But unfortunately, Paul went through, I think, four days in the hospital on sepsis, and we're going to have him speak for a minute or two on that. And after Paul, then we're going to hear from Howard Walensky, who was really the creator and producer of this program. So, Jeff, you, you want to speak for a moment? Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good morning, good afternoon for wherever you are. I'm Jeff McLennan from smoky Northern California. Um, <clears throat> I would like you to please take an intense interest in helping us run this organization <clears throat> by making a donation today. Uh, today is a good day because I do have four coupons um, from an organic manufacturer of foods. So the first four people that donate $25 or more will get a free item from this organization. Uh, I'm not here advertising for them, but I use them myself. They're plant-based foods. However, the only way that we are going to continue to stay on the continuum, the leading edge, the sharp mind of what we're working with, this cancer, is by information. Fiat lux, let there be light. If you want the light and the information, then you have to support us. You can go to our website and hit the donate page. There's also Mark's address on there. So if you want to save us any fees that come through the uh, financial processing service, you can mail, hopefully, a generous check directly to Mark Lichty. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You're on, Paul. Hello. Um, I live near Boulder, Colorado in retirement. I uh, just a quick background. I owned a travel agency specializing in international travel for 27 years. And I've been dealing with uh, prostate issues probably for the past 20 years, starting with um, prostitutes and uh, had a number of bouts with that. And then in uh, 2005, I was diagnosed with a G six uh, cancer. My doctor recommended uh, surgery within 30 days, which I chose not to do and was on active surveillance for uh, five years and uh, uh, would do annual color dopplers just to monitor my uh, cancer and uh, got along five or five years. All of a sudden it jumped to a well, through a biopsy, a Gleason 8 in uh, 2010. And um, the um, result of that last biopsy gave two bad news. Once my Gleason went way up to 8, and the other was that through that experience, I got sepsis. Uh, it was probably partly a fault of... Uh, not prepar no preparation. I was doing a color Doppler. The doctor said on the spot, looks like we ought to do a biopsy without doing any pre-antibiotic treatment. And so I was a thousand miles from home, agreed to do it. And two weeks, well, a week to two weeks later, I started running a high fever and just felt totally miserable. One night, about 11 o'clock at night, I went to the ER and they sent me directly to the hospital. 
and I spent four days in the hospital and it's, they took a couple of days to diagnose it. That it was sepsis. And um, so uh, I took and uh, then had intravenous antibiotics for the next two weeks uh, daily. And so um, that's uh, kind of my experience. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I'll take over from here. Uh, th thanks, Paul. And thanks everybody for coming today. If, if there's a hero in this story or if there are heroes in this story, uh, they include uh, Agnes Goldbranson, who wanted to know why her father died in an Oslo, Norway hospital from a brain clot days after undergoing a transrectal prostate biopsy. She suspected a link between the sepsis and the biopsy, but all of her father's doctors, save one, brushed her off. She stuck to it. She, she asked questions. She was a true activist acting on behalf of all of us. And she, she in a sense, is the reason that we're all here today. Uh, she couldn't save her father, but she undoubtedly has saved other lives, certainly in Norway, by asking questions. She's a model of activism and selfless activity to look out for the public health. And so Agnes, if you wanna take over and, and tell your story. Yes, hello. Yeah, Agnes from Oslo, Norway. Um, I have about 10 minutes. I've written a little and um, sometimes my tongue, you know, it's, I'm not used to speaking in English, so be patient. So Confucius, the Chinese philosopher said, the essence of knowledge is having it, apply it, not having it, to confess your ignorance, which is written on my father's gravestone. My father loved life. He came from a hardworking family with a very bold mother that raised him. As every woman after the war was taking care of the household, she opened her own store. With little knowledge, she learned on her way, raising my father to think as her, and so did he raise his children. His life's work has been fighting for bettering the safety and human lives in our cold climate. He built and was an expert on fireplaces and chimneys, which is very important here in the North. He was a social person with many friends. He loved hunting, but wouldn't kill a fly. Once killing one, he looked at me and he said, open the window, the fly also has a life. All creatures has a life. He loved James Bond and villains, history and creative thinking in science. He was highly creative and sometimes he could almost predict the future of science. I inherited my creativity from him. He helped me opening my first store. I was so scared and he looked at me and he said, what can go wrong? At least you have tried. Try and fail, it's better than not trying, he said. Treat everyone with kindness and be fair. As long as you do, you will have success. And so I have turned to my business, trying to think as he did. When I worked with the future queen of Norway, I was so scared. I have a big portfolio of celebrities and no one scares me, but the royals do. He sat me down and he said, remember that she's a human just like you. She eats, she sleeps, and she goes to the toilet. And you have to know that she also makes mistakes, just like the brain surgeon and the president does. When my father died, I had a terrible feeling that something was wrong and I started asking questions. He was healthy, he was rebuilding a house, carrying 15 kilos heavy cement blocks at the construction site of his investment. 
So I couldn't understand that less than two days after his transrectal biopsy, he had a blood clot in his brain. My logical thinking thought it was way too close to be a coincidence. In November 2017, he got his prostate minimized with 227 layers. In three of those layers, they found cancer. On his 68th birthday, 7th of February of 2018, I went with him to Akir Hospital. The doctor told us he needed to do the transrectal biopsy. We got scared and anxious, but the doctor said it was little in comparison to the amount they had removed, but he needed to know what stage his cancer was at and called him in for a biopsy at Tuesday, 27th of February, 2018. I wanted to go with him, but I think he was a bit embarrassed. He told me to leave him alone. He could drive his Viking car to the hospital and did not attend me to help to follow him the next days. So he goes alone and he does this tri transrectal biopsy. The day after he did his surgery, he told me, he told my brother he didn't feel too good and that he was going to bed early. Early that following morning, around five o'clock in the morning, he calls my brother and tells him to drive him to the hospital. My brother gets worried and call an ambulance. He gets to the closest hospital, Akir Sikus, which was one of three hospitals he was involved with. They said he had a woke up stroke. The family was there and he had a hard time to talk and he was cursing while, while holding my hand. He knew what was gonna happen. He lost consciousness at two o'clock. He got transferred to our main hospital, Eriksospitalet in Oslo around midnight where they tried to remove the blood cloth. The night of the 6th of March, he died. I had such a bad feeling and talked to my brothers. They didn't want to follow up and thought I had lost my hairdresser's mind following up on this. It was not going to bring him back. I wanted to get his journal from his regular doctor and she did not want to give it to me. I had to tell her I was not living without it and I was threatening I would call my lawyer. I was thinking that she was hiding something. I went through all of his papers. I called the first hospital, Akir University Hospital and asked if the doctors could talk to me. And I asked them questions like, did you pick up information from AMK at the hospital? Did AMK call my father after he called them? I wanted to know if an ECG was performed when he was admitted to hospital. The nursing records, could I see them? The stroke patient form. Why did he have difficulty breathing? Did he get blood thinners? Did he get thrombolytic? And did they perform CT? How could he get so bad from 12 o'clock to two o'clock without anyone intervening? He also had great difficulty swallowing, which we in the family pointed out several times to the nurses. We perceived that he was left at this point very much to himself. He did not get O2. Why didn't he? What is the reason he got nebulizer? Why is the journals from the hospitals here in Norway not shared? Isn't the lack of information between doctors and hospitals extremely dangerous? They didn't give us any answers and they told me to call the new neurosurgeons at the hospital in Oslo. We went there and the two neurosurgeons said that this had nothing to do with his transsexual biopsy. This was a common stroke. My father's girlfriend was supporting me up until that time, having experience as a doctor's secretary. She asked good questions and helped me along the way. On my way home in my car from Rikshospitala, my gut feeling was stronger than ever, and I decided to make one last, one last call to Akir Hospital, which is the main hospital in Norway for urology, where he did his biopsy. 
I called and said my father did the biopsy on Tuesday and died on Thursday and asked them if they please could put me in contact with a urologist because I had questions I needed to ask. Shortly after, the professor Truls i Bjerklund called me back and wanted to meet me immediately. Not only had he been fighting to change the routine for transpiral biopsy, but he also was my father's doctor. Dr. Truls said he was certain I was right on my assumption. At that moment, I found peace. In that second, when he believed me, I knew that this was bigger than I could imagine. Not only has Truls been fighting my father's case, it has changed the routine in Norway. 50 to 60 men like my father, someone's grandfather, someone's love, someone's friend can now live their life in health. Living and not knowing what my father's case has helped changing. I wish someone had asked the questions before me. His cancer was mild and he could have lived with his cancer until he died naturally. How come politics and science need civilian life to get lost when the data and science and the knowledge to change lives are already there and not at least economy? Now I know and after reading and learning, I ask you all, how many men live with reduced life quality after going through complications around the biopsy? I know that Professor Truls's work also brings my father's peace. He used so much of his life fighting for secure, to secure humans through his work. He would be so proud of me of being bold, asking questions far beyond my knowledge. Again, the essence of knowledge is having it to apply it, not having it to confess your ignorance. And I will add on to ask questions what can go wrong? At least I tried. Thank you for listening. Well, th thank you, Agnes. And I, you don't hear it, but I think people are applauding your efforts. Uh, you changed things in Norway, uh, but did. yeah. But there, there's a bigger world out there, and uh, you you are a model for all of us. Um, our, our next speaker is going to be the doctor, actually your father's uh, urologist, who who took you seriously and asked the questions, continued to ask the questions, and and conducted research to get the answers. And that's Dr. Uh, Charles Bjorklund Johansson. Uh, Who's, who's a lead, leading uh, urologist in Norway and also was active at the European level with the European Association of Urologists. And he served on, on their uh, guidelines committee and on their uh, committee uh, deal, dealing with, uh, with uh, this, these issues. So uh, Trolls, why don't you take over? Can you hear me, Howard? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for this kind introduction. And thanks for inviting Agnes and me to tell our story. I have uh, called my presentation Prostate Biopsy and the Oslo case. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Howard has uh, asked me to address, um, I just need to change something here on my screen, to address uh, several topics. And you can see them here. I will go through all of them. What is sepsis? What is resistance and stewardship? What is contamination categories? And then several aspects of the Oslo case with Roar Gulbrandsen. So let's start with the first item. What is sepsis? Well, sepsis is the most severe infective condition. Uh, it's 
it's also called the sepsis syndrome. And um, we used to talk about the severity continuum that starts with an infection. And then the patient develop was what is called the systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. And then there are three severity grades of sepsis, simple sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock, which may lead to death. And I will briefly address the Sears syndrome. You can see what it is based on. It is body temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and the number of white blood cells. And I used to think that when the heart rate increases and the respiration frequency also increases, it is because the body is struggling to bring oxygen through its tissues. An increased temperature and white blood cells tells us that the body is fighting an enemy. It's what we call the host response. I know this is a busy slide for uh, lay people, but it describes the pathophysiology of sepsis. And we used to say that sepsis, it's a total pathophysiological collapse. It starts with the bacterial products called endotoxin, release a massive response from the immune system called cytokines. And these cytokines leads to a hemodynamic collapse. It affects the circulation. But there are other mechanisms as well. You can see here some of the circles in red. And these tells us that there is problems with the peripheral circulation, that blood clottings can occur at different levels. And this may result in necrosis of body parts. To the upper left, you can see the fingers of a young woman who developed sepsis after an obstructive ureteral stones. The next two slides to, to photos shows the fingers of a man who underwent 10 prostate biopsies and lost 10 fingers. On the right, you see, this is not a urosepsis, it is another type of sepsis. A man having lost parts of his extremities, and as you can see, he also lost his penis. I would like to stress that there is increased risk of death related to sepsis. And this is related to blood clots. If you look at the risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, and other thromboembolisms, the risk was 2.2, 5.5, and 15.5 within 30 days after sepsis with the Staphylococcus aureus. And if you go to the lower part of this slide, you can see that the all cause mortality among patients one, two, and five years after sepsis was 23, almost 29, and almost 44%. So looking at mortality um, within the first month after biopsy is a too short period to learn the full truth. And I would also like to emphasize that silent sepsis is a reality. So NOAA switched to antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, in the European Association of Urology, we have done several studies, uh, surveillance studies on antimicrobial resistance among bacteria causing what we used to say hospital acquired infections. And on the left hand side here is percentage and all the different bars represent different antibiotics. And the two groups of columns to the left represent ciprofloxacin and trimetoprim sulfamatoxazole or cutrimoxazole, which is both are commonly used 
as antibiotic prophylaxis in prostate biopsy. And the colors of the bars represents geographical regions. The, the middle blue is the global figure. And my point is that in today's urology, it is almost 50% resistance to all the most commonly used antibiotics. There is one exception, and that is imipenem. And the rule is that we should not use this drug for prophylaxis. We should reserve it for treatment in case sepsis develops. So this is the situation in Europe and Asia. And here you can see the figures from the United States. There are different colors for the different regions in your big country. I would like to draw your attention to the situation in the Southeast states. You can see here at the bottom that the resistance to fluoroquinolones is almost 52%. And if you go to the southeast, the resistance is almost the same, 52% again. And that is the reason why we should not use fluoroquinolone for antibiotic prophylaxis in prostate biopsy. And antimicrobial resistance is uh, the cause of increased concern. And they looked at this in the United Kingdom they prepared a national report that was chaired by Jim O'Neill. And this report concluded that if antibiotic resistance is allowed to increase at its current rate, it is projected to cause up to 10 million deaths per year globally by 2050. And it will be the most common cause of death. So this is a dramatic prognosis. And what makes it a real big cause of concern is that we have no new antibiotics in the horizon. That's why we need to use those we have with caution. And that's how the concept antimicrobial stewardship was developed. It is about the optimal selection, dosage, and duration of antimicrobial treatment that results in the best clinical outcome with minimal toxicity and minimal impact on subsequent resistance. That means we should use antibiotics that do not have collateral defect causing a resistant uh, bacteria to develop in ourselves and in our children. So this is a big problem. And European urologists have strongly recommended all urologists to adhere to the principles of antibiotic stewardship. In principle, this means that we should not use the most powerful antibiotics for prophylaxis. We should not prescribe antibiotic prophylaxis for more than 24 hours. This is the principles of antibiotic prophylaxis. And in Europe, we also did a study on the consequences of adherence to our guidelines on antimicrobial stewardship. And we could demonstrate that this adherence reduces antibiotic consumption without increasing postoperative infection rate. Adherence will lower the prevalence of resistant microorganisms. And what is also important, it reduces healthcare costs. And now briefly on contamination. This is a concept which Semmelweis thought the medical profession. But this table that you can see here uh, stems from World War II, when surgeons had to prioritize patients for emergency surgery that had the highest chance of surviving. So they introduced four or five categories. Clean means that there is very low risk of infection. It's about up to 
A dirty field means an infected field or a fee surgical field with spillage of intestinal content. And the important thing here is that a transrectal biopsy, as you can see to the lower right, belongs to the contaminated or dirty situation. And the risk of infection, as you can see here, is from 15 to 40%. While a transperineal biopsy belongs to the clean end of the spectrum. And the risk of infection is much lower because of the contamination. And I will now briefly take you through the principles of prostate biopsy. In both transrectal and transperineal biopsy, the urologist uses a transrectal ultrasound probe. And this probe is used for imaging of the prostate and guidance of the biopsy needle. In transrectal biopsy, the biopsies are taken through a channel in the probe and through the rectal wall. And as you know, we are using the one needle for each procedure, which means that as soon as the needle has been through the channel the first time, the channel will be contaminated and all succeeding biopsies will also be contaminated. While in transperineal biopsies, the biopsies are not taken through a channel in the probe and not through the rectal wall, but biopsies are taken through the skin, which is disinfected. So transperineal biopsy <clears throat> is uh, done as an outpatient procedure. Patients are scheduled for 20 minutes. There is no extra equipment as compared to transrectal biopsy and no extra staff. That's how we're doing it in, in our hospital. And our procedure has been copied now by numerous other hospitals. And now we move to the core topic of this presentation, which is infective complications in prostate biopsies. I have been in this business for very many years. And I remember when uh, transrectal ultrasound was introduced and transrectal biopsies was introduced. And we were uncertain if we had to give antibiotic prophylaxis or not. So we did some randomized control trials with a placebo arm. That means that half of the patients did not get antibiotics. And that is what I would like to demonstrate here. It might be in your interest to go to the line uh, where you can read Crawford et al. next to the bottom. Crawford, this is a US study. I know the first author. And you can see here that without antibiotics, 48% of patients will have fever. 16% will have bacteremia. That means um, if we culture the blood, we will detect microorganisms. So this is the situation without antibiotics. And of course, we very early realized that we had to give antibiotics. But we also recognized that there were severe complications. And uh, we observed this for a few years. And in uh, 2003, we started a big European study to monitor hospital acquired infections. And in 2010, we started a special side study to detect prostate biopsy complications. And shortly after that, <clears throat> we published our first paper in the journal European Urology, which is now the world leading journal in urology, where we presented our results from the first two years. And we could demonstrate that there were 5.2% of symptomatic urinary tract infections, 3.5% of febrile urinary tract infections, and 3.1% of patients were admitted to hospital. And in those days, it was almost exclusively transrectal biopsies, and almost all patients received fluoroquinolone as prophylaxis. <clears throat> Shortly after that, there was a systematic review published in the European Journal by a US-based uh, epidemiologist and US uh, urologist. And now the situation seemed worse. 
uh, fever was reported in up to 17% of patients, up to 6.3% had been hospitalized, sepsis occurred in up to 3%. And what was probably most important was that during this review period, they observed that the risk of infective complications had increased. And if the patient took more procedures, the risk increased further. So now to the, the Oslo case. And I would like to emphasize that what I'm going to say now is done with the permission by Roar Gulbranson's family. Uh, I had been lecturing about prostate biopsy for many years in many countries. And I used to say that urologists should be aware of antimicrobial resistance. They should uh, check their own local resistance data and complication rates. They had to consider contamination categories and develop local protocols for antimicrobial prophylaxis. And as you heard Agnes said, one day I was informed that a young woman had uh, uh, called the hospital and wanted to talk to me. I remember her father very well. I used to have up to 25 patients in my outpatient clinic every day, but I remember this man and he was almost my age. And to calm my patients down, I often talked to them about their job and about their family. And what, the reason why I remember him is that he was so proud of his children, of his daughter. I have four daughters myself, so I had no problem to identify with him. So we had a very nice conversation. We did a transrectal prostate biopsy after he had been diagnosed with an elevated PSA after a previous transuretral resection of the prostate and MRI had shown some suspect findings and he was scheduled for a, for a biopsy. As you heard Agnes say already, <clears throat> he had the lower abdominal pain on the first day after biopsy, he didn't feel well. On the second day, he couldn't find words. He had balance problems, loss of lateral vision. And the doctors on call in the hospital thought he had an apoplexia. And as you heard Agnes said, he died six days after biopsy. I <clears throat> had a meeting with Agnes and uh, Ruar's girlfriend, Agnes' husband, it, it was a very strong meeting. It was a very strong woman and very kind people. And I realized they had the very best intentions. So we, we had a good conversation. And I said to them that I will go through our results. I will now do what I have advised my colleagues to do elsewhere. I thought that our own results were good that we didn't have much resistance, that we didn't have much complications. Although I had been arguing to my director that we needed to change our practice. So the first thing I did was to check the local resistance rates to Escherichia coli, which is the most common pathogen in the urinary tract infections. And I was shocked to see that the resistance rate to trimetoprim sulfamatoxazol in our three urological units went up to 57% in the prostate unit and about 60% in the bladder and stone unit. I was almost shocked. And then we looked at the resistance to cyprofloxacin, which was the alternative antibiotic. And we could see that this had increased over the last six years from about 13% up to more than 40% in the prostate unit. And this was again frightening. And then I went to the national uh, patient registry in Norway and asked to get national data. I did that together with a statistician at our National Institute of Public Health. And as you can see, the results were again frightening. This is the percentage of patients hospitalized within, with infection after prostate biopsy 
from 2011 to 2017, an increase from below 2% up to almost 10%. And we also looked at the number of hospitalizations per prostate biopsy procedure. They were a bit higher. And the reason was that a significant proportion of these patients, they were hospitalized several times due to their complications. So I realized <clears throat> that I had to do something. So I wrote the Chronicle. And first I went to the editor of the Norwegian Medical Journal and asked if he would publish my findings. And he said that these findings are so significant that you should not wait several months for publication in a medical journal. You should go to our leading newspaper, which I did. And my message was that the local resistance rates for the most commonly used prophylactic antibiotics were a cause of concern. The rate of infectious complications after transrectal biopsies was unacceptably high. And I recommended Norwegian men to <clears throat> not undergo transrectal biopsy unless the urologist did a rectal swab culture beforehand. And I said that patients should ask for a transperineal biopsy instead of a transrectal biopsy. And this was published in our national newspaper. But this presentation was coordinated with Agnes and her family. So the journalist in charge in the newspaper made an interview with Agnes and her father's girlfriend while I wrote the Chronicle. And this is the first page in the leading national newspaper. And the heading reads, uh, boyfriend and father died. And the heading in bold black reads, warn against the risk of prostate biopsy. And then there is a short abstract reading, one out of 10 patients who underwent prostate biopsy in 2017 got severe infection. Consultant has changed biopsy procedure after death of patient. And here you can see the chronicle. I know only a few of you can read this. I heard there was a man named Leif from Sweden. He can read it. And I think also the chairman can read, but it, it's about a warned disaster in Norwegian healthcare. And in the subsequent days, there was a, was a lot of comments. Um, the guy you can see on the top right here is our health minister. And in the following weeks and months, there were numerous letters, numerous articles. We were heavily crit criticized from our colleagues and say that they said that we were not telling the truth. We were frightening patients. So this was published on the 1st of November, 2018. But as, as Howard said, <clears throat> I have also been active in the European Association of Urology. So we were kind of working in parallel. So uh, three weeks later, there was a paper in the leading journal, European Urology, where my colleagues wrote the chronicle, should urologists stop prescribing fluoroquinolones as default? The reason was that we didn't believe that it could provide protections for patients anymore. And during the debate in the national newspaper, over opponents said, please continue this debate in another forum. Uh, this looks to us as if they didn't have any arguments more. And we were prepared for that. So because we had already submitted a paper for publication in the World Journal of Urology with the Norwegian, uh, with the Norwegian uh, figures. And in parallel, there was a new regulations coming out from, from the European Medicines Agency, which gives advice to the European Commission. And on the 11th of March, they published uh, new marketing authorizations for medical products. Uh, and this was about quinolone and fluoroquinolone and where they deleted the indications. So the message was that prophylaxis 
of recurrent urinary tract infections following transurethral surgery and transrectal prostate biopsy was not, no longer recommended. And a few weeks after that, the European Association of Urology wrote a letter to all the national societies where they said, do not prescribe fluoroquinolones. And the European Association said to all its members that possible alternatives are targeted therapy approach based on rectal swab cultures, as well as the change to transperineal prostate biopsy. This was 3rd of June, and on the 8th of June, our paper was published. And the reason why it took some months before it was published was that we wanted to publish also the discussion that had taken place in the Norwegian newspaper. For example, there was a group of seven urologists who said that who wrote in the newspaper that infectious complications after transrectal biopsy is not a cause of concern. And when we asked them for reference, they said it's their own impression. And we argued that our concern is supported by evidence. And we also said that transrectal biopsy violates the principles of contamination and antimicrobial stewardship. Our opponents said that the rates of hospital admission do not fit with our impression, and they are false. And we argued that registered data are more reliable than own impression, which is not a valid reference. And then our opponents said there is no increased risk of death after biopsy. And we argued that data from the Norwegian patient registry are linked to the cause of death registry and cannot be doubted. And we could demonstrate that the relative mortality increase is 261% within the first month. And then there was the chairman of the health directorate panel who said that transperineal biopsies increase costs and should not be recommended. He did not provide any reference, but we did. And we could demonstrate that transperineal biopsies can be done in local anesthesia at no extra costs. And finally, there was a chair of the cancer registry who said that active surveillance and repeat biopsies is a good alternative for patients who fear side effects or radical treatment. And we argue that for every repeat transrectal biopsy, the odds ratio for infection increases 1.3 times. So in this paper, <clears throat> we we presented the mortality rate within the first month after prostate biopsy in Norway. If we go down to the bottom, uh, you can see that there was 260% excess mortality, which is highly statistically significant and corresponds to about 10 excess deaths in Norway every year. This is based on data from almost 100,000 biopsies and our population is 5.5 million. And this, this is, these are death rate within the first month. And as I to told you in the beginning, the, the risk of death is, uh, remains high for several months after uh, sepsis. And recently we published the results of our international study of prostate biopsies. It was submitted uh, in October last year, published now in January. And you can see that the national Norwegian data are confirmed in this international study where the rate of postoperative infections, post biopsy infections goes all the way up to 10%. But there was a difference because in the rest of Europe, <clears throat> uh, the majority of patients were seen by the GP and given antibiotics. So if we add the percentage seen by the GPs and the percentage that were hospitalized, we end up with about more than 10%. And again, we confirmed the death rate of 0.1% due to sepsis. So the aftermath of the Oslo case, I think it's a very strong story. Um, Norwegian complication rates have been confirmed in international studies. Almost all Norwegian hospitals have switched from transrectal to transperineal prostate biopsy within one to two years after 
the chronicle and the interview with Agnes and her family. All doctors and nurses at Oslo University Hospital are now undergoing training courses in the diagnosis and treatment of sepsis. If you remember, they denied that the Gulbranson had a sepsis in the beginning. Our hospital has stopped using antibiotic prophylaxis due to very favorable results of, of transperineal biopsies. EAU, the European Association of Virology, in their guidelines, which, which are world leading guidelines, recommend that urologists switch from transrectal to transperineal biopsies. Ruar Gulbranson's death was finally regarded as a complication of prostate biopsy and his family received financial compensation from the Norwegian system of patient injury compensation. And I can tell you that data on biopsy complications from the Norwegian patient registry after the Oslo case are now being analyzed. And I'm very much looking forward to be able to present these data. Um, it's, it's difficult to be a doctor and, and a urologist and find one's way through a lot of information, a lot of science, but we need some navigation points to be sure that we do the right things. And what is, should be our leading point is the words of Hippocrates, who said, primum non nocere. In English, that is, first of all, do no harm. And in order not to do any harm to the patients, we need to know the benefits and harms. We need surveillance. And um, if we do not have very large surveillance data, we can help with mathematical modeling. And the other important navigation point to stick to contamination category, that is what Semmelweis told us about. And that is what no has been picked up by the WHO safe surgery checklist before every procedure the surgeon, the urologist, must inform the rest of the team that he has con she has considered the contamination category, the risk of infection. And finally, we need to adhere to the principle of antimicrobial stewardship. Today, I received uh, an SMS and a nice picture from Agnes, which I will share with you. It's a photo of Ruas gravestone. <clears throat> And uh, the inscription reads, as Agnes said in the beginning, to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. And, and when I read this, I think that this is a message to all urologists, to all surgeons and to the whole medical community. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, Charles, thanks for sharing yours and Agnes's story. Um, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Rick Popert, a urologist. He likes to call himself a prostatologist and one of the leaders of the Trexit movement, uh, transrectal exit. They, and they've been having uh, remarkable results in the United Kingdom in getting the word out to uh, urologists around the world. Um, I believe he is in attendance, but uh, we're going to show his video from, uh, from the rehearsal we had last week. And hopefully he'll be available for our question and answer afterwards. We're running a little bit late and uh, you know, no, nobody says you have to stay with it, but I hope that you do and, and we'll have questions and answers after, <clears throat> after one other speaker. So uh, Bill Manning, do you wanna take over from here? So, um, <clears throat> Howard, can you hear me? Yes. So I'm actually coming to you from the Welsh countryside and you can hear a tractor in the distance. I thought I would be in London, but circumstances from COVID overtook us. It's not that we're fleeing London to get to the country. It's just the way things have worked out. But I'm very glad that um, I recorded my talk beforehand, but I have to say, Agnes's story and Trulls's response, they're just phenomenal. And I think the thing that comes out of all of this is the dangers of transrectal biopsy, which have been 
clouded for many, many years. And I personally um, have my story, which I think tells in the, in the video presentation that I do and about why we certainly believe within the UK that transrectal biopsies have to stop. And, you know, I'm so grateful to Agnes and Trules because he's brought to this whole situation. The one thing that probably get, kept transrectal biopsies going was the fact that people would give ciprofloxacin and other antibiotics all the time in order to try to combat it, but it can never be combated. So I'll leave you to uh, run my talk. And um, my wife has gone off in the camper van and has given me some time to be with you. So thank you. Well, we, we appreciate it and hope you can stick around uh, for the questions and answers. So uh, Bill Manning, are you able to uh, man the video? the active surveillance patients who are listening to this recorded um, talk. My name is Rick Popert. I'm a urological surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, and I have a profound interest in prostate biopsies. I do have some disclosures of relation, in relation to this meeting. Prostate cancer diagnosis has been predicated upon the PSA blood test a rectal examination and transrectal biopsies for nearly 40 years. Now the problem with transrectal biopsies, as a colleague of mine calls them, is they are transfecal biopsies. What I'm about to tell you, to me, is so blindingly obvious that it comes as a big shock to most people because they just don't seem to understand the risks associated with transrectal prostate biopsies. Quite simply, the prostate is a clean box, the rectum is a dirty box, and therefore there is always a risk that you can produce infection in relation to transrectal biopsies. Now within Europe, there was a randomized study on prostate cancer screening, and they found that even from six core transrectal biopsies, three and a half percent of patients have fever, and a um, 0.5% of patients, so one in 200 patients, actually develop sepsis. And we know that with transrectal biopsies, the risk of infections and sepsis is as high as 1%. And many patients don't want to have a repeat transrectal biopsies. They have it done once, they get away with it. They don't really want to have to go through another biopsy. Now, you would already have heard about the experience in Norway and about a poor gentleman who died after transrectal biopsies and what this caused a big uproar in Norway. And when they looked at this, they found that a lot of the problem was related to increased resistance to antibiotics, particularly ciprofloxacin, which is the commonest antibiotic that we use in patients who are having transrectal biopsies because it generally will reduce sepsis. But if organisms are resistant to these antibiotics, then sepsis can occur. Now, I don't know the exact numbers, but there are approximately 1 million prostate cancer diagnoses, diagnoses per year. That's a minimum of about 2 million biopsies per year. If you look at the figures in the ERSPC cancer screening study and an American study, the PLCO screening study, infection rates and hospitalization were of the order of about 1%. Now, 1% of infections in 2 million biopsies is 20,000 cases of sepsis and 40,000 cases of other complications, such as bleeding or retention of urine when you can't pass your water. But what about risk of death? It's very difficult to get an estimate because these randomized screening studies only involve between 12 and 15,000 patients, and that's probably not enough to show actually a risk of death. But if you estimated risk of death of between, between one in 50 or one in 100,000 patients undergoing prostate biopsies, which is quite a high, a high number, it would account for at least 20 to 40 deaths per year over the last 30 years. And I have to say these deaths are, unavoidable, are avoidable deaths. And it is a real problem. Now, everybody's tried to get around it because when we do transrectal biopsies, a lot of patients are given 
antibiotics before the procedure and after the procedure. People have involved using rectal swabs where you clean the back passage with iodine and you use and you take samples of the bacteria that are in the back passage and you look at those on a special bacterial plate and identify if, they, if these bacteria are resistant to these antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin and then you can give them additional antibiotics to try and overcome the risk. And in our hospital group in London, we actually did a study and we looked at patients who'd had transrectal biopsies just with standard antibiotics and our infection rate was 2%. That's at the top part of this slide here. If we did patients and we gave a rectal swab and that rectal swab was negative for bacterial resistance, the infection rates were 1% and we were giving people three days of ciprofloxacin. If the swab showed resistance to ciprofloxacin. We gave them additional antibiotics, but the actual infection rates were nearly 9%. And when we actually looked at stratifying people to either transrectal biopsy, if they had no evidence of resistance organisms, their infection rates were very low. But if the group actually had resistance to these organisms, resistance to the antibiotics, and we did transperineal biopsies, they had no infection. So if you convert to transperineal biopsies, and we did this, and we showed that in over a thousand patients, the infection rate was less than 0.15%. So it's virtually zero risk of infection if you do the biopsies transperineal through the perineal skin. But what's waiting around the corner? If we continue to do transrectal biopsies, there are other organisms, something called carbapenemase producing organisms, which is Enterobacteria ci, which is a bacteria that sits within the gut. Therefore, it's going to be in the rectum. And this looks like, you know, the growth of the spread of COVID in, in, in Europe. In fact, it's not. It's the spread of these bacteria and the fact that these bacteria are becoming so common. And the big problem is that there's no effective antibiotic for these bacteria. And they're spread by hands, food and water, and they cannot be eradicated from the gut. And if people get infections related to this, it can be extremely serious. And hopefully this can be prevented by not doing transrectal biopsies. And that's the whole principle of doing the transperineal approach. Now I had a patient, this man, joy in life was to climb mountains. He walked up mountains, he had retired. And he thought he might have prostate cancer. I thought he might have prostate cancer because he had a, a high PSA blood test. Now, I did transrectal biopsies. We didn't find any cancer, but he developed life-threatening sepsis. He ended up in ITU, ended up, ended up becoming diabetic, and the man never climbed a mountain again in his life. Now, I nearly killed him, and that was back in 2005. So in nearly 15 years ago, I stopped doing transrectal biopsies and we started to do these transperineal biopsies and we stratified our patients to be those who were poorly controlled diabetics, those people who'd had a urinary infection previously, those people who had an enlarged prostate or had had antibiotic treatments. And what we also said is that anybody who's being considered for active surveillance we wouldn't accept a transrectal biopsy as a confirmatory biopsy. They had to have a transperineal biopsy. And also, any patient who'd had a previous negative transrectal biopsy, if they still thought or the doctors thought they might have prostate cancer or an MRI scan had suggested an abnormality, we said they shouldn't have another transrectal biopsy. They should have a transperineal biopsy. So we wouldn't give another opportunity for infection to occur. Now, what we found was 36% of patients who'd had a previous negative biopsy had cancer. Most of those patients chose definitive treatment. 37% of patients who were thought suitable for active surveillance based upon their initial biopsies actually had more significant cancer when we did transperineal biopsies. And 63% of patients who were having transperineal biopsies as a primary biopsy actually had cancer, which is higher than the cancer detection rate for transrectal biopsy. So as far as I was concerned, this was a really good way of assessing and evaluating patients. And we had no sepsis. 
We did have some minor complications with retention of urine and bleeding, but nothing that was very serious. Now, in the UK, we started doing this, as I say, back in 2005. And at that time, about 5% of all, trans all, of all trans prostate biopsies were transperineal. By 2012 to 2016, data showed that nearly 20% of biopsies in the UK had become transperineal. And by 2017 to 2019, in nearly 33% of all biopsies are transperineal. So the obvious question is, well, why aren't we doing all of our biopsies transperineally if there's no risk of infection? Well, the problem is that different hospitals, different centres have a different volume of take-up of transperineal biopsies. This slide shows in the boxes to the right, my hospital group, which is in southeast London, in 2017 to 2019, over 70% of all our biopsies were transperineal. Now they're now 100%. The hospitals over to the left, or the hospital groups across to the left, which are based around, largely around the counties around England, most of these places are still doing transrectal biopsies. But it is changing. Here you can see, this slide shows, in blue, the hospital trusts that are doing transrectal biopsies and the risk of sepsis. And you can see the majority of the sepsis is occurring to the right-hand side of that graph when most are being transrectal biopsies. When most hospital trusts are doing predominantly transperineal biopsies, the risk of sepsis is much less. Now, in the UK, nobody gets prostate biopsies without an MRI scan, and that's extremely important in evaluating who is at greatest risk for prostate cancer and how we can do better targeted biopsies. What we also find, though, is a lot of patients have prostate glands and they have abnormalities in the anterior prostate gland, which you have to sample transperineally. And if you try to do all these biopsies within a rapid, fairly rapid period of time, within 21 days, which is what we try to do within the NHS, the problem is a transperineal biopsy requires a general anaesthetic, and that creates waiting lists and delays to the pathway. And even though you can do these biopsies under local anaesthetic, they're described as tolerable, but they are not comfortable. Now, I thought there was no solution until I was introduced to this biopsy device called the transperineal access system, the precision point system. Now, this was something that I realized would allow me to do an evaluation of the prostate gland where a prostate gland which contained a lesion, and I'd be able to do systematic biopsy to the other areas. And importantly, I could do this under local anesthetic in the outpatient. That for me was absolutely critical. Now, this short video shows the biopsy procedures that we do. We now do this entirely under local anaesthetic in the outpatients. This has been filmed in an operating environment, but purely under local anaesthetic. It's arguably the biggest advance in prostate biopsy in decades, and it's all down to this. It's called the Precision Point Transperineal Access System. And it's revolutionizing biopsy procedures. Hello, Paul. Okay, so what we're just going to do is just run through briefly what we're going to do inside the operating theatre. My name's Rick Pope, I'm a urologist, and I've had an interest in prostate biopsies for many years. And I became offended by the principle of transrectal biopsies over 12 years ago when we had patients who had significant sepsis. Transrectal biopsies have been the standard technique for over 30 years, but they risk infection and false negative results. Rick Popert then moved to transperineal biopsies, but needing a general anaesthetic, it's resource heavy and expensive. Now all that has changed. Little scratch on the skin, right? Little scratch. And then you use some local anaesthetic to inject into the skin. The new precision point device is attached to the ultrasound probe and it's used to guide the anaesthetic needle into the prostate. And then we put a deeper injection up towards the two sides of the prostate. Here comes the needle now. A little uncomfortable. Very good. And then we're just injecting the local anaesthetic then. Perfect. So that's one side done. And now we've just got to do the same thing just on the other side as well. A little uncomfortable now. There's the injection going in there. It's already numb. Okay? So you're happy for me to take the biopsy? Good. All right. Yeah, that's right. 
So it's in a bit of pressure now, and you're going to feel a, a, just a little bit more of this pressure just as I pop the needle towards the prostate. Is that painful? Is it nice for pressure? Pressure. Okay, not painful at all. You'll hear the sound of the biopsy gun going off, which sounds a bit like an air gun. And you may get a few feeling just a sort of little jump. This sort of area is impossible to really target accurately with the standard biopsy. So this is why this is a better biopsy, really. And now I'm just going to walk my way across the top of the prostate. I would say it was pleasant, but it's nowhere near as bad as my advantage party. To be perfectly honest with you. The idea behind it is fiendishly simple and elegant. So it's the movement of the probe up and down, which tilts the prostate to meet the biopsy, which allows you to move one point. It's revolutionised our practice. It's allowed us to do more of our transparent biopsies under both anaesthetic and the outpatients than we've ever been able to do. It allows us to reduce the need for general anaesthesia such that the majority of patients can be done under pure low anaesthetic and some with a small amount of sedation if necessary. But the beauty of this thing is that I'm only making two punctures just in the skin and yet I'm taking 24, 27 biopsies in total. No, it's, uh, it's very cool. So very, very sure. I could say you had tired of that mess. Once the procedure's done, we just check your blood pressure and set you up. And hopefully walk you out, cup of tea, and then hope that you pass it to the other. So this is what we call the Trexit Initiative. And on the 7th of March, 2019, South East London stopped all transvectal biopsies. That is a population of 1.5 million. There are about 80, uh, 20 other networks around the UK. And we've been working with those networks to try to achieve what we achieved nearly three years ago. And Actually, it's really important that this initiative is something that we can actually keep going. When we first started, when this biopsy device first became available, which was in January 2018, by June 2018, there were 12 centres that were routinely using this device and starting to do what we've been doing. By December 2019, this had grown to over 70 centres. Now, we thought it would just keep developing, but of course, COVID hit. Now, one of the big things for me was, what was that going to mean for people trying to do prostate biopsies? Now, we were concerned about people having transrectal biopsies and getting risk of sepsis and being admitted to hospital and then getting COVID because these people would die. They would die. And therefore, the UK actually stopped doing transrectal biopsies as a general rule. Now, those hospitals that were already doing transparent biopsies could keep going, particularly if they were doing it under low anaesthetic. So from my perspective, COVID gave us an opportunity that we could grasp to eradicate the challenge of transrectal biopsies. And by December 2020, over 100 centres in the UK were routinely using the precision point device. And this is now about 130 centres, and it is growing. This graph shows the impact that Trexit has had. The graph in orange is transperineal biopsies, and this shows the growth of transperineal biopsies over the last 10 years and this was growing and transrectal biopsies were falling but if you extrapolated those graphs it would take probably until 2028 or 2030 for everybody to have converted and yet in 2020 bang the whole thing has changed completely and transperineal biopsies now accounts for nearly 75 percent of all biopsies in the uk and those places that are still doing transrectal biopsies they are looking to change. And everything is moving towards transperineal biopsies. And one of the big things that we are able to do and what we've been working hard within the UK, teaching and training other hospitals and other doctors, and especially important, teaching nurses, cancer, urology nurse specialists. Now I have two nurse specialists, Jonah, 
and Grace, who work in my hospital, they do transperineal biopsies themselves under local anaesthetic. And that's one of the big keys for us. Jonah has become awarded Urology Nurse of the Year, specifically for his role in teaching and training transperineal biopsies to other nurses and specialists. And that is how we do it. And we do this by hands-on training courses. People come shadow us, we go and visit them, we go and support them starting their list, and we allow them to independently deliver their service in the outpatients. And the nurses can take back control of the prostate biopsy pathway. So they see the patients at the beginning, they walk themselves the whole thing right up to diagnosis, and they support them the whole way. And it doesn't take that long. 15 to 20 biopsy procedures can be the nurses can be trained, and by the time they've done uh, 15 to 20, they can be signed off as being independent. This is something that is happening in the UK. General anaesthetic transperineal biopsies are an expensive resource we can't afford. They do result in delays in the time pathway. General anaesthetic procedures as a whole have been kiboshed by COVID. We can't afford to do stuff unnecessarily under general anaesthesia if we can do them. And transrectal biopsies, in my view, have an unacceptable risk of sepsis. And we can do these local anaesthetic biopsies with limited puncture techniques. They can be done comfortably in the outpatients and they have virtually no risk of retention and no risk of sepsis. In my view, local anaesthetic transperineal biopsies are a better, safer biopsy and they are fit for a COVID future. And I believe that within the UK, we should achieve our Trexit by the end of 2022. At least that is my ambition. Thank you for your attention. And as I'm saying all the time, it is time to Trexit. And we need to end transfecal biopsies. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rick. Uh, we, we are running a little bit late. Uh, we have one more video from, from Australia. I, you know, I've uh, been discussing with uh, some of the other moderators what to do. Should we go ahead? This is a brief video. I, I think just go ahead with the video and then I'm still here for some questions. Okay. Um, if that would be helpful. Yeah. Well, I, I think I'll just take charge then. And uh, it's a brief video with uh, Dr. Jeremy uh, Crummert, uh, an Australian urologist who has played an active role internationally uh, with the Trexit movement, uh, transrectal exit. And uh, in Australia, as in Norway, the uh, patients, have voted uh, with their feet and their prostates for change. And uh, the Australian National Health Scheme has, has made changes uh, in payment. Uh, one of the big issues, at least in the United States, is uh, reimbursement. In Australia, they're paying a premium to doctors who use transperineal approaches. So Bill, if uh, you want to run this video, okay. and then, then we'll go to questions and answers after that. Basically what happened, I guess for me is um, several years ago now, it was really just witnessing what was happening on a, on a regular basis. And, you know, it would be, an unusual week in the hospital if there wasn't at least one patient who was in hospital uh, with sepsis after a prostate biopsy. And I guess what I was noticing as a then sort of junior consultant or attending as you'd call it, um, is that it was just wasn't really noticed it was just um oh well, this is just what happens you know you do a biopsy and there's a risk of sepsis and i just thought that's crazy because we're the doctors and we're causing the sepsis so it's what we call iatrogenic or you know doctor caused and um so yeah you know, i was seeing guys on the ward and and they weren't just on the ward they were genuinely suffering um in terms of their extremely high fevers feeling absolutely horrid um, and having un uncontrollable shakes, which is called rigors. Um, now, we could get on top of it with antibiotics, but sometimes that was a challenge as well because more and more we were noticing that 
the antibiotics that we were routinely giving actually weren't touching the bug. And so we'd have to go to the next one up and uh, get more high power to, to knock it on the head. So for example, we might start with the, you know, amoxicillin and gentamicin, and if that didn't work, we'd have to step it up to miropenem. Now miropenem is uh, one of the imipenem classes of antibiotic, and that's kind of viewed as the last line of defense. And we already know that there's uh, an array of bugs that have become uh, resistant to, sorry, carbapenems, I should say, not imipenem. And, um, and, you know, they've got a very high mortality rate if you get them in your bloodstream. So it was all very much uh, like a runaway train heading down uh, the wrong direction. Um, and then I, I did have one of my own patients um, who I did a, a transrectal biopsy on. And, yeah, he ended up in the intensive care unit. Uh, I think he was in there for two nights. He was on inotropes, which are medications to support blood pressure, because on its own, on, on his own, um, his blood pressure would have dropped through the floor, and that probably would have killed him. Um, and I just thought this is insane. I, he was a perfectly well man um, prior to the biopsy that I did on him, and <laughs> to add insult to injury. The biopsy result was negative. He didn't even have prostate cancer. So, I mean, that's another issue in terms of the the very poor diagnostic yield of a uh, a blind biopsy where there was no prior imaging. That was in the days before MRI. Um, and uh, MRI again is now, uh, at least in Europe, um, is a standard part of the workup because it's in our guidelines. Has been for the last couple of years. So. Uh, that's been a huge advance as well because uh, it's prevented a whole lot of unnecessary biopsies in the first place. But then if you're going to have a biopsy, um, we've got to stop doing it through the rectum because of exactly this sort of scenario. So that's how I uh, I guess I got into it. I also um, had access to uh, transperineal biopsy through my uh, teaching hospital, which is the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, which is part of Monash University. And we... Uh, working with the radiation uh, oncology doctors, they would routinely use the transperineal approach for brachytherapy, so insertion of radioactive seeds. Um, and so we started using that, and and really that's uh, when our experience began. And it wasn't just our hospital. I, I, I should acknowledge Peter Mack, um, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne also. We're, we're very much heavily into it. Um, and that enabled us, in fact, just by virtue of a handful of centres around the city um, to gather together, you know, in retrospect, a relatively small number of um, cases. And when we pulled them, uh, I think it was less than 300 for memory, uh, we, we published on that. Uh, we, you know, we kept a, a very... Um, rigorous prospective database uh, on all these patients that we were doing transperineal biopsies on and, and we found that the sepsis rate was zero. And that was the hypothesis that it was going to be very low because we thought, well, we're not disturbing any of the rectal bacteria. We're not, we're not touching the rectum whatsoever. We're just passing our needles through the skin, which we know is very easy to sterilize and um, just with routine surgical preparation. Um, you know, disinfectant, um, and uh, and that was proven. Uh, so we had zero, not only uh, zero sepsis, but I think zero infections. So in other words, not even low-grade infections. So it really was sort of proof of principle. And then, and then we just continued to collect data, um, followed on from that, and then uh, we revisited our database and went back to it and found that there were uh, nearly twelve hundred patients, consecutive patients, um, all having a transperineal biopsy, again, zero hospital admissions for infection. So uh, I think we had one prostatitis, uh, which was a low-grade infection treated in the community with oral antibiotics. So uh, not perfect, but that's pretty mild when you compare it to the sort of rates we were seeing. I should also point out that we did a statewide study in, in this, this state of Victoria here where 
we collected government data on all the transrectal biopsies that were being done over a four-year period. Um, and the, the rate of uh, sepsis uh, was around 2%. Um, so, you know, one in 50 guys that we're doing these biopsies on were coming in septic. Now, septic, as I mentioned, as I sort of alluded to before, being septic is life-threatening. Um, and we also know that there is an actual mortality rate. Um, as you know, there's been mortality in, in Norway, um, but also in Australia, we know that uh, there were a couple of deaths during the study period that we looked at. So, you know, that's all very well documented and well known. Um, and so it was time to change practice. The best way to uh, promote a change or a better way of doing things within the professional community is with hard evidence um, and, you know, publishing, presenting at conferences, getting the message out based on evidence. And then once you have that firm evidence base, the next step, I think, if you want to speed up change, because sometimes even though doctors may rep may recognize that there's something's better there's all it requires energy to to move from status quo to something new right so you need a push sometimes and there's no better force i think than the threat of patients going elsewhere uh, than uh, than that to to change practice so um what happened was uh, I uh, got in touch with um, one of the sort of mainstream media outlets here in Melbourne, uh, one of the typical newspapers, and uh, we had an interview. We talked about uh, transparent biopsy, and that actually received pretty widespread uh, coverage uh, where there were a lot of patients coming in saying, oh, I saw your article in the paper, etc." And what I noticed in the, in the following months was that uh, there were a lot of my colleagues starting to make the switch. And I think that that was community pressure. Uh, the evidence was already there. It was just a matter of, okay, when, when, to, because it, it is, from a, from a doctor's point of view, it's painful. You have to learn a new procedure, which we do all the time, of course, in our training, but we do have to learn a new way of doing this uh, procedure. Um, so I have to get trained up. It's it's a change to our routine. And once you get into a, you know, a slick routine where you're very efficient and you can plow through cases quickly, well, of course, that's very uh, efficient. And no one likes to sort of muck with that. But if patients are sort of saying, well, do you do transperineal biopsy? And if you say no, and they go to another doctor, then that'll that'll change your practice in a heartbeat. So I think that that was a huge part of, of what happened initially here in Australia. And I think it was very effective. Now, I should say just quickly that um, when that article was published, there was very interestingly some pushback from uh, our society, um, and that was to say, because our urology, the, the majority of urologists weren't doing transperineal biopsy by any stretch. It was very much just this very small minority at that time. And so our society representing urologists came out saying, um, you know, transrectal biopsy uh, is really important for diagnosing cancer. Um, and so I think, you know, that they, that there was obviously an element of, uh, feeling under threat there and sure enough, you know, our society is now hugely, uh, in favor of transperineal biopsy. It was just, uh, at that time, it was very early on and the majority of members, um, would have felt put out by, by the article, but it, just shows you it takes time and and now as, as you know most urologists certainly in Victoria 
and I think it's heading this way uh, more broadly in Australia, do transperineal biopsy instead of transrectal. So there's been a massive shift. In Australia, actually, we don't produce our own guidelines. We um, endorse the European guidelines. Um, and so we basically just, our practice follows that. Um, but um, transparent, so in other words, we didn't, we didn't wait, um, I guess, for uh, transparent biopsy to be the preferred option in the guidelines. Transparent biopsy has been an option in the guidelines, you know, for years it's been known about, um, but it hasn't been uh, explicitly the preferred approach until now. Um, so in other words, the, 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 the inference is that transrectal biopsy is substandard because of its rising risk of sepsis and because it requires uh, some pretty heavy-handed use of antibiotics, which, which completely goes against everything that WHO and you know the uh, Centre for Disease Control are talking about, which is you no, know, we we need to avoid unnecessary use of antibiotics at all times. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know we we ran over a little bit in time. We certainly have some questions. I'd like to open up with a few of my own, I noticed that we're getting some, some response uh, from a couple of experts who didn't speak today. Uh, Richard Zabo from uh, University of California at Irvine, who has researched uh, this from all angles and uh, Matt Alloway, uh, who's inventor, who's the inventor of the precision point procedure that uh, Dr. Popert had mentioned. But, you know, you know, I'd like to, you know, we've gotten sort of the international view in Norway, UK, Australia, things are moving fast. And I wonder what the situation is in the United States. Um, you know, are there many places people can go to, uh, to, to get transperineal? Um, so, so maybe... Yeah, Richard, uh, do you want to take that or Matt? Um, sure, Howard and Truls, Rick, and um, Jeremy Gromit, great presentation, so comprehensive. There's not much more for me to say. The one thing I do have to say is that um, in the US, you know, we're, we're a little bit slower than uh, Europe and Australia in this change, but the, the change is in the air. The interest is there. The guidelines are going to be likely changed very soon. So I think you're gonna see a lot more opportunities for transperineal biopsy, but the take home message is, and I think Dr. Grummet mentioned this in his presentation is that it really takes the public and the patients to ask for this, the patients to demand a better, safer biopsy. That's where the change occurred in Australia. It wasn't through the societies. It wasn't through the guidelines. It was from patient advocacy groups that really uh, you know, sort of change the, the, the direction of the needle there. So we're working as a company so hard and spending so much time and resources to connect patients to doctors that can do a very nice biopsy. We're adding to the literature. I mean, a month doesn't go by without another paper being published showing the benefits. And I think it's fair for me to just add one addition to the other speakers. Everything was focused on safety once you make this shift, you realize how safe it is. You sort of forget about sepsis and infection. I have, I've seven years, I've not seen it. And don't think about it, don't use antibiotics. But the real beauty is also the increased improved cancer detection, which is now starting to hit the mainstream too. So you're talking safety and improved, um, improved diagnostics. You know, the, the era of men having three or four transrectal biopsies, not finding cancer, that is unheard of in the transperineal series. So, um, Howard, we're working very hard with the AUA. Um, we have some important meetings set up to hopefully help push this across the finish line. Because the problem in the U.S. is coding and reimbursement is a bit antiquated. And quite frankly, if you don't motivate people financially to make the change, they're just going to say, well, I don't have infection. And we know that's simply not true. 
Uh, you know, I should add, uh, people may not know who the AUA is, but that's the uh, American Urological Association, which is the professional organization for the urologists. And they are, at, at the moment, uh, writing new, new guidelines. We don't, may, maybe Matt knows what the guidelines are going to say, but they haven't said publicly, and they have, uh, they ask participants to sign non-disclosures, although I've heard a little bit uh, and that things are, are progressing, but slowly. And uh, the AUA has their virtual annual meeting uh, in September. And uh, they're gonna have a debate on transrectal versus transperineal. So the, you know, this session is very timely. And uh, the European Australian experience is, I think it's gonna play a major role here. Now, I noticed there, there were some questions, and I'm going to turn it over to other moderators after this, but there were some questions on the difference, uh, why, you know, why some doctors uh, do transperineal procedures with general anesthesia in an operating room versus those who do it in, in their offices with local anesthesia, which obviously has more risks. Uh, with the general anesthesia, I should say. So I wonder if either Richard or Richard Zabo or, or Matt Holloway can answer why is there a difference? I'm sorry, I was gonna give Richard a, uh, an opportunity to there to, to answer. Um, the, the, the short answer is that um, as urologists make the transition, they're a little leery to dive right in under local. And so a lot of them want to learn the technique under um, either general anesthesia or sedation. And that, that's one reason. The second reason is that we developed the precision point access system so that we could do it in the office. We could do it under local anesthesia very effectively. But if you're using a different, more antiquated transperineal approach, for example, the grid stepper, you absolutely have to do that under general because it's too, it, it's, it's a, it's a God awful procedure attempted under local, but our technique was specifically developed to overcome those obstacles. So it's going to be a mishmash of different types of anesthesia for now, but I expect that as thing hit the mainstream, probably in the ballpark of five to seven years, we'll start to see of the vast majority being done under local anesthesia. But I think all men have the right to be sedated, quite frankly. Some men, you know, I mean, we don't want it to be an anxious, um, difficult situation, even if it's as is, is, is simple as it can be done under local. You know, some men do have some apprehensions, and I think they have the right to be given some mild sedation. Okay, well, thanks. Um, yeah, I'd like to have uh, moderators, uh, other moderators step in with questions, and then maybe we can uh, have Dr. Zabo uh, speak out, but we should take advantage of the fact that uh, Trolls and Rick Popert are here. And let's not forget that Agnes is here too, so. Howard, I, I think the, the critical thing for your patients on active surveillance is that the majority of them will have had transrectal biopsies. And the key really is in their further evaluation of their ongoing risk, the absolutely critical thing is they should have an MRI scan before they submit to any further biopsy. That's the first point. And the second point is, is that they should look for a practitioner who will do transperineal biopsies. And unless there's a real contraindication to general anesthesia, <laughs> the key would be to find somebody who does transperineal biopsies. And even if they have to have the old fashioned way, as opposed to the kind of things that myself and Matt do, that's still going to be safer than submitting to a transrectal biopsy. But the more people talk about having these biopsies and being done under local anesthetic, the more pressure that can be applied. And it becomes, it is people power. Well, thanks. Uh, um, so David, how about you? What do you got? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I'm David Keller. I'm a moderator. Um, currently, I'm in Colorado Springs. I just wanted to follow up on what Matt was saying so that we're all very clear and what the doctors are saying. Um, 
as patients, we want to be our own best advocates. And I wanted to get a very clear understanding about the different types of anesthesia. Um, I'm getting mixed messages. Um, must transperineal be done in the OR? It could be done under general anesthesia or local anesthesia, but I'm getting the impression that um, it should be an OR for safety's sake. Is that the right impression? No, sorry, Rick. <laughs> Rick is shaking his head no. He's get, looking for his volume button. There you go. Uh, I can answer I mean, that think, too. Sure, why not, why not have uh, Dr. Zabo answer? I'm in a busy airport. Um, uh, no, it absolutely doesn't have to be done under any sort of, um, uh, in any operating room theater or even in a surgery center. It can be done in a small clinic room. It's pretty easy to do. Um, and uh, just a, you just have to have good local anesthesia administered. Um, and there may be an advantage to just local anesthesia besides the savings and costs to the medical system and to patients uh, in that uh, there's less urinary retention in general when you do the literature search. And uh, the couple of um, sepsis cases that were reported in the literature under the freehand transperineal technique um, were with intravenous and general anesthesia. So um, it, it may be that people get sepsis from the um, urinary retention complication and not, from, not directly from uh, contamination going into the prostate. So that might be an advantage of the locals, although it's not statistically significant yet. It's just the numbers are too small, although we have over 11,000 uh, uh, freehand local anesthesia, I mean, freehand cases in the literature nowadays uh, and, and, and uh, increasing. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. How about uh, Dr. Popper? Do you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think um, Richard's points are very well made. I think the difference in the UK that we had to work with was that a lot of the doctors had been doing transperineal biopsies using the older techniques. And these are much easier to do under general anesthesia. In the States, there aren't that many people using those techniques. So you've actually got surgeons who are used to doing transrectal biopsies under local anesthetic in their outpatient environment, in their, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in their ambulatory environment. And the key is their own belief in what can be done. Because a lot of people believe, urologists believe, that transperineal biopsies are complicated, complicated equipment requires a general anesthesia. And that is just not true. And the fact that we can do these procedures under local anesthetic with minimal punctures is absolutely key. And once you get to see it and understand it and believe in it, you know, the, the problem is solved. So D David, another question. Yeah, I can follow up on that. Um, <clears throat> I just talked to a local urological uh, group and um, the head of the group in uh, Colorado Springs. And uh, one of their big objections was pain. So maybe you could just summarize the, the objections under pain, time and cost compare, you know, TP versus TR, please, somebody. Pain, time and cost. I, I can do that. We checked uh, <clears throat> all patients for pain after transperineal biopsies, and the average score was zero to one on a scale from zero to 10. Um, we scheduled the patients with no longer time than with the transrectal biopsy, and we have no extra equipment, no extra staff, and no extra costs. Okay. And uh, I would like to comment that um, transperineal biopsy got a mal reputation from the old days when we did the mapping and saturation biopsies. That meant that we did up to 60 biopsies, more than 20 biopsies. And this was done in general anesthesia. And when people now hear about uh, transperineal uh, uh, Trust biopsies for, for screening and for initial diagnosis, they transfer this understanding to this new technique, but it, it, it is not correct. We, it, uh, trans uh, perineal biopsies 
as the first screening can be done in local. It's no problem, but it requires training. Not all doctors are as good to uh, have the same stereoscopic vision. So it requires some training. Good, thank you very much. Um, anybody else want to touch on that subject? I thought uh, Dr. Johansson did a super job on that. Um, um, I, can, uh, I can say in the literature search, um, just to uh, confirm what Dr. Johansson said, uh, the average time for transrectal was about uh, 15 minutes, uh, for transperineal 19 minutes. Uh, the average pain score for uh, rectal was 2.5 as opposed to uh, 3.17 for transperineal. So I just wanted to throw in, you know, in large numbers under review, uh, just to support okay. what Dr. Joanne was saying. It, um, I can't tell from my screen. Is that you, Matt? Are you the no, one? No, no, that's uh, Dr. Zabo. Who's oh, Dr. Zabo. Okay, excuse me. Um, sorry, I'm just in transit. Sorry, I just got the wrong time timing here. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. I want to hand it off to uh, uh, Phil Siegel, who's another moderator, checking on questions. Did uh, were there some additional questions? And then you can hand it back to me. I have a couple more if we have time. Phil Siegel is a moderator. Um, are you able to get on um, on the on the microphone? Uh, one of the attendees asked about uh, prostate biopsies and said that his, 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 first, his first biopsy was positive, but the next two biopsies were negative and showed, quote, atypical cells. And he wanted an explanation for atypical cells. Yes, yeah, th th this, has to do with the, this has to do with the sampling. You know, that e even if you take 12 biopsies from a prostate or of 30 or 40 ml, you are sampling less than 2% of the gland. So it's uh, highly likely that you will get other answers if you do a repeat biopsy. Okay, thank you. Um, would someone want to comment on um, the risk of uh, ED, the difference between a, a transperineal and a transrectal? Yeah, I think... Um, um, Again, that uh, transperineal got a mal reputation from the period when we did saturation and mapping biopsies. And a lot of needles were injected and it was almost impossible to avoid the damage to the, to the nerves. But with the conventional 12 core biopsies, that isn't an issue anymore. Thank you very much. Um, there were a couple of, um, uh, there were a couple of, questions from attendees who, who wanted some information on, you know, physicians doing transperineal and uh, how to read a biopsy report. And I think if they look at the chat function, they'll be able to get links that'll answer their questions. And that's about it for, for what I uh, noted from uh, watching from 1230 to one. So David, if you've got more stuff, it's back to you. Okay. Um... What I'm, one of the things I thought I heard was you don't have to take an antibiotic before a transperineal. Is that common practice or recommended? Um, where does that stand? Um, we know about the problem with antibiotics because there's so much bug resistance. So you want to have minimal. And is, where, are any doctors giving antibiotics along with transperineal or is it recommended that you don't need them? Well, we, we stopped giving antibiotic prophylaxis before transperineal biopsy in Oslo. On a European level, we think that we do not have enough evidence to stop using antibiotic for prophylaxis, but we are paying a lot of attention to which is the ideal antibiotic. And our recommendation now is to use phosphomycin trometamol. It is an oral oral antibiotic. Oh, okay, it's an oral. And is, is the first letter of that word with an F or a PH? <laughs> it depends on where you are. Word English, what country? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> phosphomycin? Phosphomycin trometamol. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you I wonder much. if uh, if Rick or Matt can add anything to that. 
Oh, I can add something. Uh, Good. Howard. Um, so there's evidence coming out that uh, uh, encouraging no antibiotic use. Um, it, 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 we don't have double, you know, um, uh, random controlled studies yet on it. But uh, for instance, uh, in my um, experience of uh, 288 patients that uh, had no antibiotic. There's not one case of sepsis. Um, and um, in a literature search, it was a, a much larger number than that. Um, but it's, we think it's going to be the case that antibiotics as prophylaxis will only be required for high risk patients or immunocompromised patients. Uh, Those are all the questions that I have, Howard. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're coming up on the hour. So, so maybe, uh, I mean, we ran about a half hour late. So I think we caught up with our questions. So um, I don't know if Mark's still tuned in. If Mark wants to give some final thoughts, I, you know, I want to thank everybody that participated uh, as speakers and everybody that came. I want to thank Paul and Agnes and Trolls and Rick and Jeremy and Absentia. Um, any final word from, from the boss? Well, thank you, Howard. What a, what a great program that was. And really the message to all of you out there is it's up to us. Take back your power, demand what you want, demand a safe biopsy. That's the most important thing you can all do. So thank you again. And just to mention that the upcoming program, Howard, do you want to mention? Oh, no, OK. The, the, the upcoming program in September, um, the last Saturday in September, is going to be on d diet and lifestyle. So we'd love to have you come to that. And the following one then will be uh, on the Swedish experience of uh, dealing with active surveillance, and, and they too are are really leading the way as well. Although I can tell you, funny enough, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, the doctor who writes the guidelines in Sweden. Uh, but it's funny; there's sort of a mixed experience in Sweden with uh, transperineal versus transrectal. Uh, but I think you can wait till November to find out about that. So well, that'll be interesting to hear. So thank you all for attending.